Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. Um, today, we are welcoming to the club uh, two distinguished, distinguished speakers who will be talking about military security and related issues in East Asia. Um, our first speaker is Professor Eiichi Katahara, who is director at Japan's National Institute for Defense Studies. He is joined by Professor Tomotaka Shoji, who is a senior fellow at the Institute in the Asia Africa Division. Uh, the briefing notes on your tables uh, touch on some of the topics that will be discussed today, so um, I won't repeat any of them here. Um, although <clears throat> I do have to point out that uh, this um, talk is under embargo. If you saw the um, notice at the entrance. This is because the the institute is about to publish its um, East Asian Strategic Review for 2015. It copies here in Japanese. Um, so uh, the embargo lifts at 5 p.m. tomorrow. So remaining in this room says you will be complying with the embargo. Um, one other housekeeping point is to please, if you haven't already, uh, turn off or mute your mobile phones. Um, and for the duration of the event, and if I can stop talking now and just pass it on to our speakers. Thank you very much.皆様お集まりいただいてありがとうございます。また本日の情報につきましては明日5時まで報道禁止となっておりますので防衛研究所が明日5時に正式に東アジア戦略概略2015年を発表いたしますのでそれまでお約束を守りいただきますようお願いいたします携帯はお消しいただけますようお願いい
based on their academic knowledge and insights. So the analysis here do not represent the uh, or official position of the Minister of Defense or the uh, Japanese government. So the uh, EASR is often referred by domestic and overseas experts as an important publication of the uh, insightful analysis on the regional security issues. Since this year's edition, notes for citation have been introduced, which we expect helps readers understand more deeply the analysis in this volume. And the, uh, this publication is used uh, as a university's textbook or the uh, internally within our institute as an instrumental tool to facilitate our international exchange programs. So uh, with regard to this year's contents, this is EASR is composed of an introductory or chapter to give an overview on the strategic environment in East Asia in 2014, and several more chapters about countries and sub-regional outlooks like uh, Japan, Korean Peninsula, China, Southeast Asia, India, Russia, and the United States. We made a chapter for India or in this year's edition. In addition to that, uh, the chapter eight argues the cyber defense it's analyzing global security issues, giving important implications for the regional security. So the, uh, first of all, it's for a general overview on the strategic environment in East Asia in 2014. The year 2014 was marked by growing risks to security that could lead to serious confrontations in the maritime area in particular. Also, or the year 2014 uh, was characterized mainly by three factors. First, the complex relations between the United States and China. <coughs> and second, changes in domestic politics, like the inauguration of new administration in India and in Indonesia, which can cause significant impact on the regional security. And third, or military modernization in emerging countries in the region. Chapter one talks about Japan's security policy. This chapter mainly argues two important topics concerning the current uh, security of Japan. The uh, revision of security legislation and the revision of the uh, Japan US or defense cooperation guidelines. Regarding the right of uh, collective self-defense, the cabinet decision, uh, which was made on July 1st, 2014, aimed to revise the interpretation of Article 9 of the Constitution so as to meet the demands of the current security environment while maintaining the basic legal logic uh, of the previous interpretation. And uh, when it comes to the uh, uh, guidelines, it should be expected that the new guidelines would provide a framework for management of the risks of escalation and or continuation of so-called gray zone situation. Chapter two is for the Korean Peninsula. With regard to North Korea, its foreign and military policy was described as dual hard soft tactics. It's for South Korea. The country seeks to strengthen the alliance with the United States and relations with China simultaneously. And chapter three is for China. Regarding China, the EASR 2015 gives the analysis that President Xi Jinping has been steadily consolidating his, his power base by various measures like the anti-corruption campaign. Based on that, she conducts a proactive foreign policy and tries to manage the complex relations with the United States. Also, China promotes peripheral diplomacy in order to transform the existing regional order. As for maritime issues, China keeps taking a strong stance on issues concerning core interests. Chapter four is about the Southeast Asia. 
In 2014, Southeast Asia witnessed a serious confrontation between Vietnam and China in the South China Sea amid China's oil exploration activities. Against the backdrop of China's assertiveness, regional countries like Vietnam and the Philippines try to enhance their capabilities for coastal defense. And ASEAN continued to negotiate with China on concluding a code of conduct. But in 2014, little progress was made. Chapter five is about India. India in 2014 was characterized by the inauguration of a new prime minister. The Modi administration pursues to realize a strong India. And for that, Modi adopted policies like the neighborhood first, trying to keep economic ties with China, seeking cooperation with the United States in defense equipment, and promoting reform in defense industry. Chapter six is about Russia. Russia in 2014 clearly centered on the Ukraine crisis. The Ukraine crisis and ensuing deterioration of relations with the United States and European countries caused adverse effects on Russian economy and domestic politics and urged Russia to uh, reinforce cooperation with China. As for military dimensions, Russia regarded its military engagement in the Ukraine crisis as a countermeasure to a war by political means by the West. <clears throat> Chapter seven is about the uh, US security policy toward East Asia. In 2014, the United States, as the global power, faced various challenges like the skepticism over the U.S. rebalancing toward the Asia-Pacific, the Ukraine crisis, and serious instabilities in the Middle East. To sweep away these concerns, the United States took various measures like the President Obama's visit to East Asia to make sure the U.S. commitment to the region, more rotational deployment of the U.S. military in Eastern Europe, and military operations conducted against the ISIL. Finally, as global security issues giving significant implications to the regional security, the chapter eight talks about the cyber defense. The cyber defense means governance of all domestic agencies involved in response to chemical, biological, radioactive, and nuclear incidents. Currently, the expansion of cyber threats occurs due to the uh, diversification of terrorist activities and <clears throat> remarkable progress of science and technology. In Japan, the cyber defense has been steadily uh, developed by establishing legal frameworks and promoting interagency cooperation. Japan has had a lot of experiences in cyber defense, which could contribute to identifying best practices in bilateral and multilateral cooperation. So finally, let me notice that the uh, release schedule of the East Asian Strategic Review 2015, or the uh, Japanese edition will be issued tomorrow, on Friday, April 10th, 2015. Until then, the uh, current press embargo uh, is being imposed. Thank you for your understanding cooperation. And uh, we are now in the process of translation of the uh, Japanese version into English one. And the English edition will be issued in mid-May this year. That's all for our uh, <coughs> briefing. Thank you for your attention. OK, so um, brief and to the point. Um, as is normal, uh, questions will be open first to the working press. If you can please. Um, Raise your hand. <clears throat> if you have a question, uh, identify yourself uh, when you make the question. So the floor is open. OK. Oh, Richard.
Richard Lloyd Parry of the Times. Um, one of uh, the most controversial aspects of Shinzo Abe's uh, tenure as Prime Minister have been um, the attitudes which he and people around him have expressed uh, regarding Japan's wartime history. Um, and w w whether, whatever the official position of the government may be, he certainly perceived within the region as taking a, what you might call a revisionist view of uh, the actions of the Imperial Army in Asia and, for example, the, the matter of the comfort women. And now, of course, this, is, um, this has generated a lot of heat and there have been uh, uh, angry and discordant words exchanged between Japan and China and South Korea. But I wondered if it goes beyond that in, in, the, in the sense of affecting Japan's security. I mean, when, when people in the, the government, uh, for example, cast doubt on the, uh, the existence of the comfort women or seem to excuse Japan's wartime actions, it upsets people in China and Japan. But does it actually affect Japan's security position? Do Mr. Abe's words or the words of people around him put Japan more at risk when they say things like that? リチャード・ロイドと申します。え、タイムズ誌でありますつまり、ような状況が出てくるということは、が起こりますとどうなるのでありましょうか。つまりは現在のところは日本の安全保障そのものには影響を及ぼしていない。つまり政府が慰安婦なりあるいは戦対戦中の様々な侵略に対するこの言い訳
it's important uh, to analyze the security implications of Prime Minister Abe and other uh, people's remarks on history. But also, we have to also analyze how Japan's neighbors try to use that sort of uh, contentious issue. For example, China, uh, they try to use the history issue to increase uh, the Chinese diplomatic position vis-a-vis -vis Japan. And also Korean government also doing the same way. So, but I think the whole process is quite counterproductive. Now the government of Japan is now committed to improve relationship with both China and South Korea. So I hope uh, 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 in the near future, our leader will meet uh, Korean leaders and also Chinese leaders and also discuss uh, these questions too in a frank way. Any, res any authors on the table want to make additional <coughs> remarks? Nobody? Okay. Let's go another question. Okay. Uh, just to, sorry, just to clarify, we do have specialists, uh, as mentioned earlier, on the far table in different fields, so some of your questions may be uh, put to them. I think Jonathan was next. I'm Jonathan Sobel from the New York Times. Um, you mentioned the revision of the US-Japan defense guidelines. Um, I'm sure it's all spelled out in detail in the full report. But for our purposes today, I wonder if you could just summarize the uh, points, the direction that this review is going, uh, what is likely to change vis-a-vis -vis the previous set of guidelines, why the review is important, mm -hmm. uh, and in your view as researchers, uh, what should change? What are the, what are the key points uh, you know, that, that, uh, that the review is likely to, uh, to touch on? Thank you. Actually, the guidelines have, have not been uh, published yet, uh, so, but Mr. Takahashi will make some uh, comments on that question. Takahashi-san, please. About your question, you know, I think there is uh, there will be a two big points of the new guidelines. You know, uh, maybe more, but in in my view, I have just two. And the one thing is uh, to improve the institutional arrangement of defense cooperation uh, to respond to some kind of gray zone uh, security situation. I mean, a gray zone means you know security challenge between wartime on and peacetime, some, some, somewhere, like, somewhere between that. And uh, the current U.S.-Japan defense cooperation mechanism is based on some kind of black and white thinking. You know, uh, you need to uh, turn on the switch to start the coordination and turn off. So because of this mechanism, even the 2011s uh, earthquake, disaster relief operation at the earthquake, uh, when U.S. conducted the operation Tomodachi and Japan conducted a huge disaster relief operation, there were huge how say, requirements for coordination. But even at that time, uh, that was not enough to activate the coordination body, uh, which is established in 1997 guidelines. So. Uh, so this is a very, very big lesson learned. And the new, uh, just like the interim report says, the new guidelines want to uh, will cover that issue to make more seamless uh, defense cooperation. The second issue would be, you know, the, uh, in 1997, which, when the previous current guideline was signed, at that time, uh, there's no uh, discussion about space security issue, or cyber security issues. You remember what kind of internet you, you used in 1997. That's a big difference for now. And uh, uh, even missile defense, um, US-Japan Missile Defense Corporation, uh, technology R&D Corporation started in 1998. So uh, in 1997, uh, there was no uh, institutional framework about the space security, cyber security, and missile defense. So such kind of you know, new issue should be covered. So I think they know. In my observation, these two are the big, how to say, uh, big point for the new defense guidelines. Anthony. Uh, 
Anthony Rowley, Business, Singapore Business Times. Um, how high do you think is the risk now of some kind of security incident or confrontation taking place in the region? Um, a couple of years ago, we were all very focused on the Senkaku Islands. It seemed that any day Chinese uh, fishing boats and China, uh, Japanese uh, patrol boats might uh, uh, strike, hit each other. Uh, but uh, even now, of course, every day there are hundreds, or every year there are literally hundreds of scramblings of Japanese and Chinese jets. But so, uh, what are the chances now? Well, two things. What are the chances, as I say, of some sort of risk or, or confrontation uh, occurring? And two, is that the point of maximum risk in the region? Or uh, apart from the Senkaku Islands, are there other points that are more likely to be um, areas of conflict? あの、質問2つです。え、この地域において、え、安全保障上のインシデント、あるいはコンフロンテーションが起こるリスクはどの程度高いと評価をされてますでしょうか。もちろん、あの、尖閣ですとか、それからの周りでも、あの、中国の
reached a kind of the watershed, uh, even to change the fundamental conditions of between uh, Vietnam and China, or the uh, uh, China and uh, other countries in the region. Thank you. Could I just follow up on that then? Um, so would you, if there is a flashpoint in the South China Sea, would you define where that would be? Which is the most high risk? Uh -huh. In my view, uh, many or small or the uh, serious incidents uh, occur almost every year in the South China Sea, and sometimes in the Philippines, sometimes or in maritime areas near Vietnam. So the uh, last year, uh, the Vietnam was a flashpoint. But the, uh, you know, two years ago, uh, kind of the uh, uh, situation uh, between the Philippines and China was a flashpoint. So the, uh, it varies and it depends on the kind of the our situations, I think. Richard again. Hello, I wanted just to follow up on my earlier question because I didn't quite feel that I got an answer to it. I, I note that, um, that you don't want to comment on Japanese government policy, and I'm not actually asking you to do that. I think that whatever one, one's view of Japanese government policy, we can agree that there is a perception among some people in China and South Korea that Shinzo Abe is a, a revisionist and a nationalist and possibly a militarist. Whether or not that is right or wrong, what are the security implications of that view? はい。あの、もう一度その政府の政策ということについてのその Well, perhaps uh, I, I don't know how to put it, but uh, I'm, I think there are some uh, impact on security relations uh, coming from uh, prime minister's perceptions, remarks, and uh, regional perceptions of our leaders' remarks about history. But the important thing is that uh, we have to come to grips with facts. And uh, to me, uh, Prime Minister's remarks, uh, thinking has been largely misinterpreted by the media outside. So I think the government of Japan should be more seriously engaged in discussing these questions. Mm. That was what I was asking. Mm. You started your answer just now by saying there is some impact on security mm. relations from the Prime Minister's remarks. My question simply is what, what is the impact? Well, uh, one interpretation, this is not my view, but there are some views who, who say that uh, Prime Minister or Japan's uh, action could perhaps destabilize the relationship with Korea or China. Uh, because that, uh, that could be a, how can I say, uh, because the question is very sensitive. So also, you know, as I said, uh, you know, both Korea and Jap Jap uh, China want to take advantage of uh, Japan's uh, particular uh, revisionist view. Uh, So, so, I'm, so there, there are some, some impacts, I'm sure. But the, the, and also the United States also is concerned about uh, how Japan respond to China or Korea because uh, the situation could be uh, destabilized. Uh, so, but, but as I, you see, you know, uh, as far as uh, Japan is concerned, uh, I think the Japanese government has been really quite careful 
and uh, about uh, these questions. So I don't think there's much impact uh, on, on that, on, you know, uh, deteriorating the situation. Yeah. Could I want to say something? No? Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm here, Akutsu, from this. I wrote uh, the current chapter. Um, as for the issue of emotions and the security, uh, as re regarding Japan South Korea security cooperation, uh, the records show that uh, the impact of the kind of emotions uh, talked in the media is one thing, but pragmatic security cooperation is quite another. Records show that, uh, as you may know, uh, especially in dealing with North Korea and its uh, series of provocations, Japan and South Korea have been quite pragmatic in uh, the, the area of uh, security uh, in defense, especially within the framework of the Japan, US, South Korea trilateral security cooperation, uh, we already have reached, uh, basically reached uh, agreement on sharing information uh, in dealing with uh, North Korea. Uh, and uh, uh, up until uh, last year, uh, three countries uh, conducted uh, joint uh, maritime uh, exercises. So the past records show uh, in my field uh, that uh, despite the kind of emotion uh, being discussed in the media, uh, defense and security cooperation in nation states is quite pragmatic. Thank you. Any other questions from the press? Uh. Afternoon, I'm Kirk Spitzer, American journalist. I work primarily for Time Magazine and USA Today. Um, just a couple bigger picture questions. Um, one, what do you think was the most significant development in East Asia security over the last year? Overall, is the security situation now better than it was last year or worse? And what are you expecting for the next year or so? Is there anything in particular that worries you? Thanks. カウスピッツァです。え、アンユエスエトゥデイとタイムマガジンに所属しています。え、昨年、え、と比べまして、え、昨年の東アジアの安全保障の状況と比べて、え、最も大きく変わったものは何か。そして昨年と比べて、え、
there at the same time as we are wrote in the introduction chapter of this volume. Some sort of the uh, diplomatic efforts to reduce the risks or the uh, to or alleviate tensions occurring in some specific areas in terms of security uh, also should be you know noticed or you know we should pay attention to that kind of efforts. So the I think that the overall security environment in this region or seems to be mixed with the you know deteriorating situations and the uh, you know some sort of the efforts to improve the overall security environment that's my answer thank you Jonathan Jonathan from the New York Times again. Um, I'd like to ask some, uh, about the significance of Okinawa. Um, I, I don't know to what degree the report uh, gets into detail, but broadly speaking, it, I think the government's view and your view, it seems, is that given the changing security situation in Asia, the US-Japan relationship in the broad sense is more important than ever, uh, and a focal point of that relationship has always been Okinawa. Uh, at this, uh, in, that explains, for example, the government's determination to carry out the Futema base relocation uh, as agreed. Uh, on the other hand, I've heard from uh, independent military experts that, for example, changes in missile technology and China's missile capabilities mean that uh, on a strictly, from a, uh, strictly looking at it as a military asset, uh, Okinawa is not necessarily what it used to be. Um, could you tell me, as as military experts, and, and, and actually not, uh, the, I'm not looking for a political answer here, um, how the significance of Okinawa is changing, uh, whether it's still uh, as important as it used to be, uh, and, and, and specifically why. I mean, you know, is, is this, you know, people talk about American troops on the North-South Korea border as being a tripwire more than a necessarily a, a, a hard military defense. I mean, is Okinawa, is that what Okinawa is anymore? Or does it have you know, the same uh, value as a, as a strictly military asset that it used to, and why?沖縄の重要性ということについてお伺いしたいと思います。このレポートでマドレホド振られているかはあの存じませんけれども、いずれにしましてもあの政府それから冒険の見解としまして、そのアジアの安全保障の環境が変わりつつあると、そういう意味で
not just a high-end conventional warfare, but also grade zone and peacetime engagement. So uh, thinking about you know, grade zone challenge, uh, presence of ground troops could be critically important. So in a sense, uh, not just Okinawa, more, more specifically, the Marine Corps in Okinawa, the role of the Marine Corps in Okinawa is even more important than uh, 15 years ago. And second, you know, uh, I know uh, some military experts discusses, discuss that uh, because of the Chinese ballistic missile force, uh, frontline bases would, be, would not be useful or would be useless. You know? So, but, you know, as I said, I don't buy that argument. Uh, I have two reasons. One thing is, uh, for example, you know, Marine Corps like ground troops, it is very, very difficult to strike ground troops by airstrike. You know, uh, looking at the history of the you know, U.S. Air, air, air campaign, history of U.S. air campaign, and the Kosovo or Gulf War, even that time, uh, you know, that was very, very, very uh, tremendous power against you know the infrastructure like fixed target, but you know, uh, combat unit which is relocatable, which can be you know, uh, hiding somewhere. So to strike that kind of asset by air, air asset, especially ballistic missiles, extremely difficult so fast. The second reason is you know, this is a logic of actually American quadrennial defense review, Q, uh, quad, quadrennial defense, defense review 2010 version. At that time, you know, uh, that logic was uh, and because of the serious threat was anti-access area denial capabilities, uh, U.S. needs to keep forward the deployment force because uh, to neutralize its AD capabilities, they need uh, some kind of you know the step or some kind of uh, base to uh, to has it, to go in that anti-access area denial sphere by using that front base as our size, it's a bubble. So, so in a sense, you know, now the front line bases has uh, getting more important, is now more, more important than before in different reasons. That is, if you don't have the front line bases, you cannot go in, uh, in inside of the anti air denial sphere. Inside what? Inside HAD sphere, you know. Yeah, so but if you, if you, you, you utilize frontline bases, you could go in. So in that sense, uh, of course, you know, that base must be resilient, or you know, must be protected. So you need to have, say, uh, deploy additional or, you know, different assets compared to before. But you know, with such kind of proper, proper countermeasures, the frontline bases could be a very indispensable asset to counter anti-access anti area denial threat. So, uh, so for, for these reasons, I think you know the role of Okinawa is now even more important. And you know your last comment about you know triple A issue, and you know uh, U.S. force in Korea near the DMZ or you know U.S. ground troops in Berlin in the Cold War could be a triple A because that was you know deployed along with ground borders. But you know in case of Okinawa, that is the island. If you if you, you want to if you want to, you want to use them as a triple A, we need to deploy them in the Senkaku Island. But then that doesn't work. So in a sense, you know, I don't think that is, you know, uh, that is not a temporary. Anthony. <clears throat> there, there is a tremendous arms buildup going on in Asia. Um, do you think this will lead to a kind of natural balance of terror, you know, rather like the Cold War, where no major power will dare to strike the other? And do you think that this build-up, which you know affects China, Japan, Australia, India, and so on, can be dealt with by with bilateral alliances or, or with the U.S.-Japan alliance, or does it require some new kind of regional mechanism to prevent some sort of awful conflagration? アジア地域におきましては軍備の増強が続いてきているわけですけれども何らかの形で将来的にそれが均衡に至るというようなシナリオにもつながるのでありましょうか当然中国日本それからオーストラリア等々あのさまざまなところで場合によってはコンフロンテーションに伴うその攻撃も起こり得ると考えますけれども一方で二国間同盟を結ぶことであるいは日米同盟を基軸とした形であるいは地域的な
、えー、仕組みを作ることによって、えー、このコンフロンテーションを防ぐというようなメカニズムあるいはバランスというものは到達されるものでしょうか。Thank you very much.、Uh, it's a very difficult question because we don't know about the future. But、uh, I, I'm not、uh, pessimistic about the future.、Uh, you are right that、uh, many countries uh, are developing uh, uh, arms. And you, there, there are some people who argue that there is some sort of arms race developing. But,、uh, On the other hand,、uh, first, the US centered regional structure, regional、uh, order is still、uh, quite sustainable. sustainable. And、uh, the United States、uh, is committed to remain in Asia. There are some questions about, you know, marks about, about you know, the longevity of the US、uh, presence. But、uh, as far as、uh, Japan US alliance is concerned, we are now. In the process of further strengthening of the alliance. And also, the US has been increasing its military、uh, cooperation with、uh, Singapore, Indonesia, Vietnam, Philippines, and Australia. You know. So, I think there is kind of a balance of power、uh, which is not necessarily deteriorating. You know, we can see some kind of continuation of the balance of power in the region, which perhaps uh, maintain uh, uh, you know,、uh, regional order. And also, on the other hand,、uh, there, is an, our, there are some efforts、uh, to develop regional security architecture like ADM, ADMM Plus, also in East Asian Sec,、uh, Summit. You know. And、uh, so, and also, as I mentioned,、uh, there are some talks about、uh, crisis management、uh, mechanism between Japan and China. And also, US and China,、uh, there are some, some improvement about.、Uh, Uh, strengthening、uh, crisis management. So,、uh, on, on balance,、uh, mm -hmm. I, I can see some, some, you know, some, some improving、uh, of, of the situation in the future. But we should be very, very careful about、uh, what we do you know, in our security policy. Can I ask some, can I ask some comments?、Or、with regard to the, you know, our security situation in ASEAN and Southeast Asia. You know,、uh, as you know, well, the、uh, RCN has a long history.、Um, it was founded in 1967, and、uh, it will be near the、uh, 15th anniversary, 50th anniversary、uh, since its foundation. So, the uh, uh, Southeast Asian countries are economically developing, and they are building up their military, they are promoting、uh, military modernization. However, our RCN, our We can say that、uh, within ASEAN, the, our security environment or can be said that to be secured because of the,、uh, kind of the framework of ASEAN, I think. So, the, of course, our, you know,、uh, just a framework or、uh, just a kind of a loose collective or entity、uh, cannot always secure the security environment or in, in a region. However, I think uh, uh, in East Asia, or where the,、uh, there are some or security or kind of matters that have been happening and occurring in recent years,、uh, we should、uh, pay attention more to the kind of the,、uh, function of multilateralism. Thank you. You have a question here? Yes. フリーランスの小林ですあの中国の一方的なあのエアディフェンスイニシアティブゾーンですか、僕、識別圏が一昨年、12月に彼らが一方的に宣言したわけですが、その後の展開についてです、ね、なぜこの白書といいますか、レビューの2、30ページぐらい割いてです、ね、この分析をしていないのかが、私、まず質問。それからですねこれに対してですね、日本、およびそれからアメリカ、それから韓国
それからまあその他の諸国どういう対応を昨年からこれからすべきであったかそれからこれから何をすべきかということそれからこれがですね南シナ海へまた拡張されるという予測がありますがこれについてもうもちろんこの白書には何も書いてないと思うんですが。えー、まあここにご専門家が揃ってらっしゃるわけですからこれはどういうふうな展開になるであろうかとでこの南シナ海にこれが広がらない広げないためには何をすべきかとどういうことが考えられるかということを教えていただきたいと思います。Well, um, I'm Obayashi freelancer and、uh, my question is pertaining to、uh, the、uh, China setting the air defense、uh, identification zone. Uh, and uh, China has、um, unilaterally declared the setup of the ADIZ.、Uh, and my first question is that the, why uh, the, um, uh, this Defense、uh, Institute has not analyzed、uh, the development afterwards, the setting of ADIZ, for spending about 20、uh, pages or so in this year's、uh, report. And that's my first question. And the second one question is that regarding this ADIZ,、uh, what has Been、um, the initiative made by Japan, US, South Korea, or other countries in order to cope with ADIZ, and also、uh, what had to be done, what, need, what these countries should have done um, in uh, taking countermeasures against ADIZ,、uh, as well as、uh, what should、um, be done in the coming years.、Um, and、uh, there is some、um, opinion or forecast about the possibility that China. Uh, may expand the ADIZ into the South China Sea. And I do not believe that your report this year、uh, is mentioning about this possibility. However,、uh, what would be the outlook、uh, if it happens? And also, in order to prevent that from happening, what should be done?、Uh, and these are the questions. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, could you answer in English, please? Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. If that's okay. Uh, okay. Uh, the, uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, first, uh, the, uh, as for the Ch China's AAD set up, set up establishment of AAD in 2000,、uh, after the 2013,、uh, the Yeah, actually, the number of the China's、uh, number and、uh, the activity of China's Air Force has been、uh, gr gr growing. But, but at, the same, at the same time, the、uh, last, last year was the,、uh, the year that China has done, has done so many、uh, things. Uh, that, that, that's why, uh, uh, and the, the, uh, uh, that's why the,、uh, we, we couldn't、uh, touch on the, that. Touch on the uh, the um, touch on that issue after the after the、uh, setup of ADIZ. And secondly,、uh, as for as for South China Sea issue,、uh, I think there is a, of course it's possible in the in the near future to uh, to uh, China setting setting up the South China Sea、uh, ADIZ, especially、uh, now China is、uh, conducting、uh, land rec reclamation,、uh, expand the land, e、uh, expand the island in the South China Sea, and、uh, set up some kind of、uh, ins installation uh, like a radar or a, a airstrip or something like that.、Uh, and that may con contribute to the、uh, China's、uh, kind of、uh, activities in the South China Sea. But at the same time, China has, uh, 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 until recently, China has a clear, clear、uh, limits on their, act, their capability on the、uh, activities in, in the South China, South China Sea because they,、uh, lacked the, uh, they, they cannot reach the whole, whole area uh, they, uh, uh, they claimed because、uh, South China Sea is.、Uh, you, you, you,、uh, U shaped nine dash line is very, uh, very、um, wide area. Uh, so uh, the, the re、uh, land reclamation of the、uh, South China Sea Islands、uh, may contribute to the uh, uh, such, uh, may, may contribute to cover the、uh, 
uh, may, may contribute to uh, for uh, China's area air forces to cover uh, South China area. Um, yeah, so that, that, that's why uh, it's possible, I think. And the second question was that what should have been done uh, to take country measures against uh, ADIZ? And uh, the answer was uh, not uh, full in that perspective. So he's once again asking that question. Uh, uh, actually, uh, the um, declaration of ADIZ itself is uh, uh, to prevent the declaration of uh, ADIZ itself is very um, difficult. Because uh, it, it is based on it, it, uh, China uh, in, in the East China Sea, uh, China unilaterally uh, declared the uh, uh, ADIZ, <laughs> and and actually it, it is the basically uh, um, um, there's no no uh, legal uh, basis uh, basis in international law. That's why very very difficult to uh, for for us to prevent uh, the the. A declaration. It's, it's a declaration itself. I think. Um, yeah. ホスト的に質問。私の質問は日本及びアメリカがそのかそのか近隣諸国がこの中国の一方的なADIZ、Zの宣言に対して。宣言を無効にするために何をすべきか何をすべきだったかそれからこれから何をすべきかということなんですかこれはもうあなた方はもう黙認されたんですかこれはもうしょうがないと思ってるんですかこれが護衛庁の研修研究所のスタンスなんです
I, th I don't think such is the case. Uh, because uh, if you look at the bigger picture in the region, you can see a uh, tension between China and the United States. You know, China is rising militarily, economically, politically. The U.S. has been pursuing rebalancing strategy. So you can see some kind of action-reaction dynamics between China and the uh, United States. And if you see the realities of the security situation, I don't think uh, Prime Minister Abe's uh, particular statements or observation have a significant impact on the security situation. And if you look at the substance of the security situation, the, the reality of the security situation, that are uh, determined by a big picture, which is a very complicated relationship between China and the United States. You know, uh, there's some action reaction, you know, dynamic. That is much more, more important factor that det is determining the security situation in this region. That's my answer. Thank you. Okay, well, I, we have run out of time, so um, my last act here is to offer both of our speakers the honorary, customary honorary membership of the club. Not for life, it's for one year, but uh, I hope you'll uh, take advantage of it. Thank you. And uh, Thank you if everyone will join me in thanking our speakers today. Thank you. Thank you.